Good morning. It's a joy to welcome you to worship this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary with us or whether you are worshiping online, we are delighted to have you present with us in worship. Just a few announcements this morning uh, on behalf of a couple on behalf of Tina Kelly, who has uh, several for our youth. Uh, it, the youth survey is still open. It's on our website. She asks that you complete it. It has a number of questions that relate to programming for the fall. Uh, all your responses, if you're youth, your responses are anonymous. There's a question uh, on that survey about if you're interested in the Youth Fellowship Committee. If you are, you can just email her separately or text her separately if you want to. If you don't want to include that on the survey, just email her separately and uh, she'll get back to you about that. There is a Vacation Bible School working session scheduled for July 13th, that's this Wednesday, from 2 to 5 p.m., and lots of hands are needed. So if you are interested in helping paint some things and testing science projects, creating games, uh, your help is needed. So you can just reply to Tina to let her know you're coming. Her contact information is on the back page of the bulletin under the staff listings. Also on page six, you'll see the other announcements. I'm gonna be on vacation beginning tomorrow uh, for two weeks. If you have a pastoral emergency, please contact Pastor Helen and she can help you with that. If there's a church issue of uh, some general sort, please contact Lisa Marshall, because Lisa knows all things. Right, Lisa? <laughs> um, if it's a financial issue, contact Steve Malley, uh, but um, we'll be able to get back to you. And yes, the phones in the office are finally working. We don't have them quite. Yes, as Lisa says, woo this has been an ongoing issue for ages now. They're not 100% where they want them to be, but you can actually call the church and a friendly voice will answer. And you can also leave a message. So we're getting there. We're about 90% of where we want to be with that. Uh, you'll see uh, Hilda Lemley's family wanted to thank the congregation for sending cards to her for her 102nd birthday. She and the family greatly appreciated it. So thank you to all who uh, sent cards to Hilda. And then next Sunday, uh, Deacon Helen's going to be preaching her first sermon here. And then right after worship, there will be uh, a reception, uh, informal coffee and other things in the Great Hall. And I hope that folks will be able to stay and welcome her and uh, just give her that good Damascus welcome and help her feel at home here. Are there other uh, announcements that need to be made this morning? Yes, Carol. Okay, refugee resettlement, if you're interested, a team is being put together. 
Uh, they've got folks who have signed on for that. Uh, we could use a man, another man for the team to help uh, identify and relate to men in the family. If you can be of assistance there, please contact Carol Yoakum on that. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who helped with uh, Celebrate Damascus. Everybody who helped work on getting folks together for the parade. I want to say a huge thank you to Barry Bratford who built the church steeple for the float. I think you probably saw that when you uh, pulled in today uh, for just, you know, everything that went into pulling things together for that for Friday night. Uh, everybody who worked so hard on Saturday, even though the rain kind of thwarted us a bit. Uh, it, was, it was all a good effort and I think uh, it, was, it was well done. And so I think we can all feel proud despite the rain yesterday. And I just wanna give great thanks for everybody who put in such a hard, hard effort, good work. It was a great time Friday night. And uh, despite the rain, some good times were being had yesterday. I know that uh, one at least great success was Harwood House where they didn't have to worry about the rain, the place was full anyway. So many, many shoppers, uh, it, was, it was well done. So thank you to every single person who helped in whatever way possible. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to round up a lot of names for our next Beacon article. So you can watch for some pictures and names and greater thank yous there. But just uh, today I want to give just the broad overview thank you. And uh, I think we can give some applause for ourselves and for everyone who helped. One last announcement. You might notice we're a little light on singers up here today due to vacations, illnesses, and other things. So we're gonna change our final hymn to something familiar. I'll announce this again at the end. We're shifting to hymn 436, The Voice of God is Calling. And I'll tell you that again at the end. So don't worry about that, but we don't wanna tax you too much. So it'll be familiar at the end. Now, if you will, I invite you, as you're able, please stand for our call to worship. The world cries to us in its distress. How shall we answer? How shall we answer? How shall we answer?
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord of justice and mercy, we come to you this day seeking your healing and reconciling love. Help us to be open to your word, your presence, your compassion. Clear our hearts of those things which will block your will. Keep us focused on your enabling power so that we, having been healed, may more fully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, as we receive your word through your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to your justice, open our ears to your judgment, open our hearts to your love. Amen. The epistle lesson today comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ and Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up in, for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you have learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to, uh, to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from this, his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel yet. As I was saying, the gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put on, he, then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, "Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend." Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today our lectionary passage gives us a very familiar parable. It's the story of what we usually call the Good Samaritan. And we're told that the lawyer has asked a question to test Jesus. Now, lawyer here means expert in the law of Moses. And he says, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life. And Jesus, being the good teacher that he is, he asks him a question in return. He says, well, what is written in the law? And if the man is an expert in the law of Moses, he should know. And so the man answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Well, the lawyer has answered with part of the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, an important part of the Torah that was recited daily. And he also includes the love of neighbor from Leviticus 19. And Jesus responds by saying, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. However, the lawyer pushes it just a little bit farther, he says, It says there in Luke, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, but who, who is my neighbor? In other words, he wants to draw the circle tighter. He wants to make this more manageable for himself. We've all been asked by God in one way or another to expand our vision of what it means to be a neighbor. Like the people who would have heard the story, today's gospel story in Luke's community, we have boundaries and rules that we live by. And in the Jewish culture of Jesus' time, there were rules about how men should treat women, how parents should treat children, how Jews should treat foreigners, how Jews should treat Samaritans, how Samaritans treated Jews. There were all kinds of rules and laws set up. And these systems set up a social order where certain systems, certain ways of power and privilege were very well maintained. 
If you knew in some ways which box, to put it, to stick somebody in, which label to put on them, then you knew what the rules were, how to treat them. However, as we know from reading the Gospels, Jesus was not a big fan of boxes and labels. He didn't always follow the conventional rules of his day. He crossed many social lines and boundaries and barriers, and in doing so, at times, angered people who felt perhaps he was trying to make a mockery somehow of the Jewish faith. But here comes Jesus, an acknowledged teacher, a healer, a rabbi who talks of God and God's kingdom as no one else has done. And he amazes them. If someone is sick and comes to him on the Sabbath, he doesn't hesitate to heal that person. He doesn't tell them, well, the law is I have to wait. He heals them. If a woman who is an outcast, a Canaanite, asks him to heal her child, he listens to the prayer of the foreigner and heals her child. He doesn't keep himself away from tax collectors, even though he's equally at home with very proper and respectable people. He doesn't at times seem to worry too much about the outward niceties of the law. And I think perhaps that's what concerns people. What if everything that folks have learned about keeping the rules and what the rules are may not necessarily be everything that has to stay the same from now on. What if everything we know is right changes? What are we to do? How can we tell the righteous from the unrighteous if we can't judge obedience to the law from outward appearances? It's hard when the security of the familiar might disappear. Well, I don't think their society was necessarily that different in that way from our society now. We have systems in place, and sometimes they're difficult to escape or transcend. Yet this is precisely what Jesus was calling the people of his time to do, to transcend the system of putting people in boxes, of pigeonholing them, and it translates to our time as well. Many great preachers have preached on this story, and one of those great preachers was the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The day before Dr. King was assassinated, he gave his last speech in Memphis, Tennessee, and in it he talked about this very parable. And toward the end, he reflected on why the priest and the Levi didn't stop for the traveler. He imagined that those men were simply afraid. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was indeed known to be extremely dangerous. Dr. King said, I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the Bloody Pass. And you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt the man on the ground was merely faking. And he was acting like he hadn't been robbed and hurt in order to seize them, lure them over there for a quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Samaritan came by and he reversed the question, if I do not 
stop to help this man? What will happen to him? If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Dr. King helps us to consider our Christian discipleship with those good questions. And that latter one should be the guiding principle of our approach toward those who are in need. If I don't stop to help, what will happen to them? Or who will help? There's another contemporary Good Samaritan story that happened in California just a few years ago where one man's kindness, his mercy, his compassion started a friendship that changed both the person whose life he helped, the person he helped, as well as his life, too. Scott Coos Marcy was a retiree living in Rhode Island, and he was visiting in California in May 2019 when he met a man named Robert, who had been experiencing homelessness for over 30 years. And at the time he met him, he was living on the streets of Palo Alto. And Scott had just read a book by the Dalai Lama called The Art of Happiness, which essentially says the way to true sustainable happiness is by helping others. So Robert had it in his mind that he was gonna go hand out water to some homeless people, kind of acknowledge their existence, and he said that was the extent of his plan. That, that was it, that was as far as he got. And so he'd been handing out water over a couple of days when he met Robert. And he said he began to learn about his family and who he was as a person, and it really touched his heart. And he realized that though they were from different coasts and they were totally different people in many ways, their, their life experiences were different, they had many things in common. And what was interesting in the interview that was done with these two men, Robert, the homeless man, said, I stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit. Robert wanted a friend, and it's not like I had a whole bunch of friends, so it seemed like the right thing to do. Well, once Scott went back home to Rhode Island, the two men kept in touch via email and Facebook Messenger. And they started sharing stories and building a relationship. And when Scott came back to Palo Alto and found Robert there on the street again, he went back to check in on him. And while they'd been apart, he'd been thinking about him more and really had realized that he felt that he probably, his friend, his new friend from the street, was probably schizophrenic. And he recognized that because he had people in his own family who dealt with schizophrenia. And Scott himself struggled with depression and anxiety. And he thought, if he could get more of Robert's trust, could he help him find some treatment for this? And eventually, he said, I wanted ultimately to get Robert to voluntarily seek medical help in the mental health area, because I know I found it so helpful and I thought it would be helpful for him. But he wasn't sure if Robert would really trust him yet, so he decided he would show him his trust, and he went to sleep where Robert slept, which was in a parking garage. And so he spent the night in this abandoned, empty parking garage there. And Robert said, I couldn't believe it. Scott was true to his word. He did come to the garage and stayed there. And eventually, they did go to Peninsula Healthcare Connection, where indeed Robert's paranoia was diagnosed as a symptom of schizophrenia, and he was prescribed a medication to treat his illness. 
and he began to improve. And he got to the point where he wanted a home again. And they didn't find anything suitable in California, and he thought about a fresh start away from the state. But that was really a dream. And then COVID hit. And so Scott decided, well, why don't you come back east with me and let's see what we can find. And so they found a little place less than 400 square feet where he could make a home. Scott was a carpenter. He helped him fix it up. He taught Robert the skills. And so now, from handing him a water bottle, he now has a lifelong friend who is also a carpenter, who goes golfing with him, eats meals with his family, and is like a brother to him. And as Robert says, it all came out perfect. Now, most people's stories aren't going to end up like that. I don't think that if most of us gave someone a water bottle on the street, we would wind up with a new best friend living about 45 minutes from us who was part of our family. But I do think that the point could be, what happened if we just did one thing a little bit differently? If we just moved a little bit out of our comfort zone? What Scott said was that he believed his friendship with Robert wasn't unique and that it would happen more if, quote, people got over their fear. And there's that word fear again. That's what Dr. King thought the problem was, fear. And he said the idea that people who were homeless or fill in the blank are lazy or dangerous or something else, that that simply wasn't true. And he said that it's often our misconceptions, preconceptions, or whatever that keep us from reaching out or from helping someone else because we see them as the other, as someone that they may not be. And the story that Jesus told about the priest and the Levite and the Good Samaritan, the people who were first hearing that, probably they were not expecting Samaritan to factor in there. It was a priest, and then a Levite was like a lay minister, and then they would have expect, expected just a Jewish lay person to come along. But instead, it was a Samaritan. And as we talked about a week or two ago, that was, you know, they were like oil and water. They didn't mix. The Samaritans worshiped on Mount Gerizim. They were just like considered, oh, because they didn't worship in Jerusalem. And so it was not just that the priest didn't do what you'd expect someone religious to do. The Levite didn't do what you'd expect someone religious to do you know, professionally religious to do. But on top of it, a Samaritan did it. It wasn't just, you know, bad enough. It wasn't just boo hiss on the religious. It was a Samaritan did this. And it was bad enough that in the story when Jesus asks the expert on the law, who was the neighbor? that the man can't even say, the Samaritan. Instead, he, he just has to say, the one who showed mercy. He doesn't even want to say the word Samaritan. Being the true neighbor means that we're living actively in the world, not passively. Living a merciful life is not defined as just helping someone once or doing a good act once. Instead, it's a life in which a person's character is formed by the basic premise that they love God, love their neighbor, and love themselves. To put it another way, 
Mahatma Gandhi was once quoted as saying, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, your values become your destiny. The call to go and do likewise is challenging and transforming. And I think that's one of the reasons we need community. We can't do these things by ourselves. We need Christian community to hold us up, to help us, to remind us of the love of God, to remind us we are not alone as we seek to do what God calls us to do in this life, as we seek to live out our baptismal vows. Living out mercy changes us as individuals, as a congregation. May we be blessed with God's own mercy and grace as we strive to walk worthy of God's calling in our own lives and as communities. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, how are we going to ever be your disciples? The never-ending needs of the world, of our community, sometimes even of our own families overwhelm us. The cries of people who feel threatened by others, those who are in need, those who are in danger, those who are alienated, ring in our ears and pierce our hearts. Sometimes we would just like to hide, hoping that all this turmoil will go away, but it doesn't. It sits outside our doors and waits for us to do something. Loving God, help that something be service, mercy, and compassion. Help us to remember how you have forgiven and blessed each one of us, how you have called us blessed and beloved. You remind us in today's gospel of the mercy and compassion that a Samaritan had on one who was injured. We like that story, but it often makes us feel superior to the priest and the Levite thinking, of course I would have helped that man. I would have helped like the Samaritan. Well, Lord, if that truly is the case, help us now to take that story to heart. You call us to reach beyond our comfort zones, to reach to any who are in need, 
Regardless of any of our human means of separating others into groups that keep us apart or keep us on top. It's difficult for us to do, Lord, because it is still countercultural, and we need to feel your powerful presence with us to do that. Bless us again, O oh Lord, with a good measure of courage and strength that we may truly serve you. Bless those whose names and situations we have listed in our bulletin and that we raise in our hearts and our minds. Bless them with healing and hope. In your mercy and love, help us to reach out to others as you have reached out to us. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, God. You are our soil, our food, our water, our sun, everything we need to grow. We offer these gifts to you, asking for your direction as we work each day so that your kingdom of light becomes more and more of a reality in this world. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 436 from the big hymnal, The Voice of God is Calling, 436. <laughs>
forth out into the world, seeing the face of your neighbor in all whom you meet, giving love and mercy, and sharing the peace of Jesus Christ with others. Go forth in love and service. Amen. Thank you.